fantastic papers and uh, I let him present this paper. Thank you. So it's, uh, I'm very pleased to, to be back at IMPA and um, give this talk in this day we are celebrating the career of Aloisio with whom I worked in many papers and also together with, my, with many students from IMPA. Um, this talk may not be so mathematically ch challenging as many of the papers I wrote with uh, Luizio, but st still in the spirit of um, bringing into the general equilibrium model some institutional features, so put, put some uh, flesh and blood into the general equilibrium model. Uh, so the, our the problem we are addressing is equilibrium in uh, foreign exchange swap markets. We would like to look at the analogy with um, repo markets where securities are, uh, where the trading of securities can be funded, and look at the funding pressures that affect the equilibrium of um, uh, foreign exchange swap markets, and look at the deviation from ar arbitrage pricing which is called the cross-currency basis in this, in this perspective. So this is joint work with Jean-Marc Botazzi and uh, Jaime Luque. Um, so the motivation for, the, for this paper is the, the observed fact that um, when um, banks uh, hold large quantities of uh, foreign assets, they need to roll over the funding of these assets either by having access to foreign exchange markets or direct funding in the foreign currency. Uh, during the financial crisis, this problem became quite um, um, present. The, the dollar funding pressure that the European banks were facing as a result of uh, having accumulated large quantities of dollar-denominated assets, almost brought the whole uh, European banking sector down uh, when um, the collateral that they were held, holding in, um, in dollars lost most of their value. It is known that the Fed, together with the ECB, <coughs> made foreign exchange swaps and then the ECB provided uh, dollar funding to, to the European banks. That was the policy that was used to, to solve the, the problem. Uh, but we observe also recently the same um, issue when um, um, Japanese banks uh, that have recently accumulated also large quantities of foreign assets are facing also a similar dependence on dollar funding. And this also uh, affected the market clearing prices for foreign exchange swaps. So this is a problem that occurs not just during crisis, but also in normal times, as the recent Japanese episode showed. So what is a foreign exchange swap? So we have two dates. Uh, at the first date, there is um, a trade between a reference, the domestic currency and the foreign currency at the spot rate X. And at the next date, the, um, the exchange is reversed at the forward rate key, which was locked in at the, at the previous date. Now, a simple arbitrage argument shows how the two, the spot and the forward exchange rates, should be related to the, the domestic and the foreign interest rates. Um, the formula is, um, is this one without the, without the beta. So we have a relation between the forward and the spot rates, uh, depending on what are the interest rates for the domestic and the foreign currency. Um, and if there is a deviation, we can express it by placing the, a beta here or an alpha in the denominator. 
And this means that uh, if the domestic currency is in shortage, then the owners of the domestic currency would only agree to do the swap if they will be compensated at the next date by having an effective interest rate which exceeds the domestic rate. Alternatively, of having a positive beta here, we could have a negative alpha in the denominator. And if you look at the behavior of, the, of, that, of that deviation beta, which is called the cross-currency basis, we observe that um, um, using the, the alpha in the denominator, we see that for the dollar-euro pair, um, at the peak of the crisis, there was a huge um, um, negative alpha, meaning that the, the scarcity of dollars led to a peak of the currency, cross-currency basis. More recently, um, look, if we look at the Japanese episode, we see that the cross-currency basis uh, almost reached the, the same levels it had uh, at the, during the European sovereign debt crisis of 2011 and 12. So, um, uh, big deviations from arbitrage pricing also occur in normal times, not just in, during crisis. To understand what is behind um, this behavior of uh, the cross-currency basis, we would like to model uh, the competition of banks and see how banks uh, get funded. So, the reason we, we look at banks is due to the fact that, they don't, that banks dominate the foreign exchange market. So if you look at the balance sheet of banks, we have to consider assets, liabilities, and uh, uh, so the, the, the non-equity liabilities and the, and the equity. So on the asset side, we have the securities that have been pledged or not. Uh, we have the loans that banks gave. We have cash. On the liabilities, we have the deposits and the loans that, were, uh, that the banks have asked for. And then we have the, the equity, the stock. In the previous literature, um, this um, issue of, of um, uh, uh, departure from arbitrage in the, in the foreign exchange markets was uh, briefly touched by Garliano and Peterson in a paper that um, had a much broader um, purpose, which was to address the failure of arbitrage pricing of securities and derivatives in the presence of binding uh, margin requirements. The margin requirement that they have considered is of this form. Uh, they have uh, uh, one just one unsecured credit market with a position at them and, um, and just one collateralized uh, credit market. And the wealth of the agent um, should cover the margins that uh, would be paid by uh, both the long and the shorts that's why we have here the absolute value of the security position. And this is the margin coefficient, 1 minus h, and should cover also the unsecured position. So under such constraints, all positions become bounded, so both the unsecured positions and the, the secured. And uh, what drives the deviation from arbitrage pricing is the shadow price of such um, margin constraint. And it was suggested that for the case of the cross currency basis, um, we should have also um, a deviation uh, driven by uh, such, um, um, such shadow value, which uh, and they computed that this shadow value turns out to be the difference between unsecured and secured interests. Okay. But the full version, a full analysis of the, 
of the foreign exchange swap market and of the cross-currency basis was not carried out in their paper. And, we sh and there are some issues that we have to, to be careful when we, we, extend that, we, we extend the analysis to, to that market. Um, one problem is that um, if, we have, if we have several instruments, so if we have several, um, if we have several collateralized loans or several uncollateralized loans, it's no longer possible to bound the, the positions. And also, it's not clear that the currency cross-currency basis would be driven by the unsecured secured interest rate spreads. So what we would like to do is to uh, build up a model that can um, uh, give us a precise precise results on what drives the cross-currency basis. So in our model, we have um, just two commodities, one domestic good, one foreign good. Banks maximize utility functions, or we can also suppose they maximize profit functions, and uh, they are subject to several funding constraints. So to simplify, we just have two bonds. We can think of this as government bonds, one domestic, one foreign. And we have two additional banks on top of the, two additional agents on top of the banks. These are the issuers, so the government's issuing the, the bonds. And banks start, we, and we focus on two dates. So at the initial date, the banks start with uh, some holdings of these bonds, um, bonds that have been issued before. To simplify, we also assume that the first date is not a payment date, it's just a trading date, while uh, date two is a payment date. And also to, to keep the model simple and not to have more dates, we just um, think that um, the terminal, the mature date is the second date. So that means that at day two, there are no coupons being paid, just the principal. Market clearing is given this way, so the sum of the initial holdings should be equal to the sum of the positions of the banks. So if C is the date two payment, so as I said, just the principal, then the endogenous return of the bond can be defined in this way. So it's uh, where uh, Q is the market price of the bond at the, at the first date. And, but in addition to the, repo, to the bond market, we have the repo market where the trading of the bonds can be funded. So in this market, we allow for um, bonds to be pledged as collateral. Uh, so we denote by theta and psi the, the repo long and the repo short positions. So what this means is that uh, theta is the, so let me start with psi. Psi is the amount of the bond that gets pledged as collateral in a repo loan. And theta is the amount of uh, collateral that the agent accepts when he gives the repo loan. Okay. The cash loan given in repo is usually less than the value of the collateral. So that's why we have here this parameter, this coefficient h less than 1. So 1 minus h is the haircut in repo. Okay. And uh, repo markets clear when the sum of the repo long positions is equal to the sum of the repo short positions. So again, an agent is long in repo if he accepts collateral. An agent is short in repo if he pledges collateral. Okay. So following, following a paper 
we have been, we wrote it in, in, uh, since JET 2012, we can write the relation between the, the security and the repropositions using box constraints. So this says that the sum of the security and the repropositions should be non-negative. So this has the, the following um, two roles. On one hand, it says that in order to pledge, to pledge a, a security, you must have a long position in the security. So in order to have psi positive, you must have a long position in the security. And in order to go short in the security, you must have accepted the security as collateral. So to have a negative B, you must have theta positive. Okay, so that's how the security positions are related to the repo positions. So if this were just a plain collateral constraint, um, the theta would not be here. It just would, it, we would just have the constraint saying that in order to pledge, you must have a long position in the security. Um, so the presence of the theta makes it more than a collateral constraint. Uh, because we are allowing the, the short sale of the security that was accepted by the collateral, so the, accepted as collateral. So the, the, the creditor in repo, he can reuse the collateral by either pledging it again in another repo loan or by short selling the collateral. So selling a security that is not his own, but um, is but he has, since he has temporary possession of that collateral, he can reuse it, and uh, namely by short selling it. In addition to the, to the bond and the repo market, we can have an, an, an uncollateralized funding market where we have um, unsecured borrowers who may be charged different interest rates. So we can have a segmented, segmented and collateralized um, uh, credit markets with interest rates that are specific to the bank that is borrowing um, in this market. And then uh, the average of the offer rates, so the average of the, um, of the interest rates that are charged to different borrowers is, um, we can think of this as being the LIBOR rate. Although, of course, the, we, we have to be a bit careful because in LIBOR, usually the, it's the average of the, of, the, of the rates that the banks announce of the bank that as, as being the rates that they estimate to be charged, whereas here it would be an average of the rates that, are, that, that they are effectively being charged. And then we have a, uh, the spot market for foreign exchanges and we have the, the swap market for foreign exchanges. So we can bring this, all these markets, all these um, transactions together when we write the no overdraft constraints in each currency. So at date one we have an overdraft, currency, an overdraft constraint in the domestic currency an overdraft constraint in the foreign currency. And this uh, um, is just saying that the, the consumption is, has to be, in, 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 let's say, in, in dollars, has to be covered by the value of the endowments in dollars. The, um, the foreign exchange uh, trades, both in spot or, or, or swap markets, the security, the domestic, the dollar denominated security trades, the repo trades on that, on that security, and the uncollateralized uh, positions. So uh, uncollateralized um, credit, uncollateralized borrowing. Same thing for the foreign for the next uh, currency. And then at day two, we have um, um, on the right hand side, we have the, um, the um, here we have the, um, the swap, the foreign exchange swap position multiplied by the, the um, forward rate. 
We have the repayments in the unsecured, uh, unsecured uh, credit markets. We have the, the, um, the dividend, the, the coupon being paid um, on, um, on securities. I'm sorry, here the uh, Q2 should not appear because I'm just presenting the simplified version where the date two is the maturity, so we shouldn't have Q, uh, this price here, just the, just the principal. And then we have the repo repayment at an interest rate, which is called the repo interest rate, which was locked in at the initial date. So <coughs> it's, um, uh, there is some analogy between the, rep the, the foreign exchange swap and the repo trade, because the repo is also a swap is a swap of uh, currency and cash um, at, um, at uh, a repayment at a, a repayment which was also locked in at the initial date, just like the foreign exchange uh, rate that was locked in at the initial date. Now we have to explicitly model the issuers, so the governments, that uh, serve, serve the, the public debt using their, their endowments at the second date and possibly also the, the swap, uh, foreign exchange swaps. At the first date, uh, we have just this, uh, uh, no overdraft constraints for the governments relating um, endowments and, um, and the foreign exchange positions. So by explicitly mod modeling the issuers, we, we can have Valras law holding at uh, each date. Now, it's important to notice that um, box, the box constraints and the overdraft constraints are not enough to bound security positions, to bound, to bound the financial positions. And to see this, um, well, let me just um, recall what would happen um, even, without the, even without the presence of um, foreign exchange markets. So if we had, if we had just one security, um, using, by combining the box constraint and the budget constraint, we could bound the security and the repo positions. And we would get that the, posi the, the leverage would be bounded in this way. So we just combine, we just combine the, let me go back. So if we combine the box and, um, and the budget constraint, we, we see that um, the, that the, the position in the, in, um, let's say, the positions in repo and the positions in security get bounded, so we have leverage bounded. Leverage becomes bounded. But if we have many securities, this could not be done. So even in the absence of foreign exchange markets, if we have many securities and, uh, and repo, we uh, box and together with the um, with budget constraints are not enough to bound positions, to bound leverage. What um, we, we have done in, um, in that same paper in 2012 was to consider two, two institutional arrangements where leverage gets bounded. One is by segregating the haircut, so modifying the, the box constraint so that the haircut the haircut portion cannot be reused. So that means that um, um, when, um, when the repo long accepts collateral, he has to put aside the, the haircut, he has to put aside the difference between the value of the collateral and the cash that he gave. So that, that benefit, that difference should be put aside, should, should not be reused in either uh, a repledging or a short sale. So in that case, 
If we have segregated haircuts, we get bounded leverage. Another case is uh, by um, um, keeping the box constraint unchanged, so by having a 1 instead of H here, but uh, by having um, a, a different treatment of haircut across individuals by considering dealers and non-dealers, non-dealers having uh, the benefit of collecting haircuts, uh, having, the, the, having to pay haircuts and dealers collecting haircuts. So that means, so in, but uh, on, and on top of that, assuming that dealers have their positions bounded by regulation. So in these two situations, we can bound leverage, um, even if, if there are many securities. However, in this paper, I'm not going to follow neither of these two routes. I'm going to use another device to bound leverage. I'm going to use uh, equity requirements. Because since I'm looking at the model of banks, I can, I sh I can, I, it's tempting to explore the, um, the equity requirements that banks face to see if that can lead, lead, lead us to um, bounded leverage. So introduce requirements that are in the spirit of the Basel framework. So I'm assuming that the equity of each bank should be some, some fraction, to be at least some fraction of, of its assets. So in other, in other words, this means that the non-equity the non liability should be bounded by another fraction of the bank's assets. So let's see what are the bank's assets. The bank's assets are the, 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 security, the value of the security positions. So the difference, if, even if there are short sales, this would be the, the, the difference between long and, and the short position, so the net position. The, the loans given, that were given in repo, the value of the loans that were um, were uh, given in repo. The, the value of the loans that, that were given in unsecured markets and the, and the value of endowments, which we, so this is a very simplified model where we, we just have banks, we don't have uh, depositors, we don't, we don't have firms. Uh, so it's a very simplified model. So maybe we can think of these endowments of the banks as being the, as, um, as being um, a proxy for what the, what the deposits would be. And the leverage requirement just says that uh, on the left hand side we have the, the, so the liabilities, so that means the, the loans that were um, asked by the bank in repo in both currencies and the loans that were asked for the bank in the unsecured market so this sum of non-equity liabilities should be bounded by some fraction of the assets that I've written up, up here. Assets in, uh, denominated again in both currencies. Now if we add up these uh, equity requirements across all banks, we get this expression. And this allows us to, to see that uh, the, the market clearing positions become bounded. Because you, you have on the right hand side, for instance, on the, on the right hand side, you have the, you have the, you, there will be an, a, a term which will be the sum of the ripple long positions, whereas on the left hand side, we have the, an expression with the sum of the ripple short positions. Under market clearing, the two sums should be the same. So then we get that the sum of the, so the aggregate value of the, um, of the repo short positions becomes bounded with this coefficient by the aggregate initial holdings of the bonds and the aggregate uh, endowments of the commodities. Okay? So this equity requirements uh, imply that uh, market clearing uh, 
market, market clear, uh, the, 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 the positions that are compatible with market clearing become bounded. So there is no need to introduce any ad hoc uh, bounds on positions. Um, the equity requirements give us those bounds. <clears throat> Not the assumptions that we make on um, utilities are quite standard and on endowments also. And an equilibrium consists of a vector of um, prices uh, for in all markets, including um, uh, so in the, the interest rates uh, and an allocation of choices for the banks and for the governments, for the issuers, so that uh, the agents are maximizing utility subject to the box constraints, the, the budget constraints, and the equity requirement constraints. So, we, yes, we, so we model the, ex, the haircuts as being exogenous. Um, we don't want to be so ambitious to, 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 to address that, that issue. So if, if we want to endogenize the haircuts, we will need to, to, to take into account uh, default, take into account default in repo markets. But default in repo markets has to be done in, um, very carefully because um, these are uh, recourse loans. So if, if, if someone defaults in a, on a repo loan, that triggers uh, bankruptcy. So we have to model the partition of the, um, of the, of the estate of the, of the bankrupt agent. But if you didn't have the haircuts, then this would not work. You do need the haircuts. No, I don't need the haircuts, OK? <laughs> so I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, that's a very important point, uh, also in comparison with, uh, with what was done by Garlian and Peterson, OK? So even if, I, if I, even if I didn't have haircuts, I would still have a cross-currency basis. So what is crucial for me is the, um, the funding pressures, so the shadow values of the box constraints. I will, so I'll get to that in a minute. Well, um, the government can also consume, uh, can, can also consume uh, the commodity denominated in his own currency, so he has a standard utility function, okay? Now, so moving tw um, towards the, the cross-currency cross basis issue, we see that um, <coughs> if, we, if the funding is done through repo markets, so if the relevant interest rates are the repo rates, we can define the possession value of um, each currency. So that would be the premium of the currency's MRS over the repo return. So that's how we define the possession value of a currency. So it's the, on the, on the, numer on the numerator we have the, um, the ratio of, uh, of the shadow values of the no overdraft constraints in that currency in the two dates. So the numerator is the MRS. In the denominator we have the return, the repo return. So rho D is the repo interest rate. So this is how, the, so this premium is the, we call this premium the possession value of the current, of the domestic currency. We do, and we do the same for the, the, the foreign currency. And then we observe that uh, there will be a basis if and only if the, the, the possession values for the two currencies differ. And there is a, <coughs> um, an interesting analogy with repo, uh, as I said, both repo and uh, foreign exchange swaps have this uh, swap feature and they have repayments locked in at the initial date. So if we, if we look at the first order conditions for repo, 
So we have a first order condition on security positions, a first order condition on repo positions. They look like this, where uh, mu is the shadow price of the box. And we see that um, the security will have a possession value if this mu, if the shadow price of the box is positive. And this possession value drives the, um, the repo interest rate below what the risk-free free rate would be. So the greater is the possession value for the currency, the lower will be the, um, the repo interest rate. And the repo interest rate may even become negative if there is very big uh, possession value. So, so this is related to specialness. So we, uh, in securities are said to be on special if, uh, if the respective uh, repo rates are below the general collateral rate. So the, 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 what's in the, the interpretation of this uh, possession value for a security? So it's the desire that an agent has to, to short without having to, 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 to borrow the security by accepting it, it as collateral or the desire to, to pledge the security as collateral without having the security as a long position. So, so, so this is the interpretation of that possession value. So if, uh, if, there, is a special, if the, there is a very strong interest in shorting a particular security, we should expect the, the possession value for that security to be quite high, the ripple rate to be quite low. This, so there is an analogy with repo since we, since uh, with an analogy with what happens in the in foreign exchange swaps. See, since the the, the the possession value of a current of the of the of the, of the currencies or, or or more precisely the, the the difference between the possession values of the two currencies, is what drives the the cross currency basis. And to be more uh, precise, we have this proposition that says that uh, um, if, the, if the repo markets are active in both bonds, there will be a pair of banks such that the cross-currency basis will be in this interval, where um, here in the, the, in the denominator we have the, the difference between the the shadow value of the box for the domestic uh, denominate for the domestic bond, the shadow value of the box for the foreign for the foreign bond. So this means that um, the higher is the the higher is the 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 shadow value of the box for the domestic bond for the dollar bond. Uh, the higher should the cross currency basis. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the higher is the, the, um, the shadow value for the, for, the, for the bond, for the euro's bond, the lower will be the cross-currency basis. So if the funding pressure in euros is alleviated, the cross-currency basis gets reduced. So it's a difference between the funding pressures in the two in the two bonds that drives the basis. <coughs> so, um, of course, uh, so in, on top of the box constraints, I, I had introduced this equity this equity constraint. But the shadow value of the equity constraint does not appear at all in, the, in these formulas explaining the basis. That's an important point because the shadow value, the shadow value of, um, of, um, of the equity constraint affects um, in the same way the, the possession value of the two currencies. So the effect the, the impact of the equity requirement is it ends up being uh, zero on the on the cross currency basis. So this is um, an interesting um, feature because it says that the, the cross currency basis is driven by funding pressures, not by solvability issues. Um, 
So during the, during the 2008 crisis, we had both. We had funding pressures, we had solvability issues, and one might think uh, that both would affect the basis. Now, in this recent Japanese episode, we have just funding pressures in dollars uh, affecting the Japanese banks, but we don't have solvability issues. And our results show that the, the solvability uh, issues, so the, the shadow value of the equity requirements, do not affect the base. It's just it's, it's the funding pressure, it's the funding frictions in the, in the bonds denominated in, uh, in each currency that end up affecting the, the basis. Um, <clears throat> so we can uh, take a step, uh, another step, and uh, try to write the basis in terms of observed market variables. So we can look at the spread, the spread between, um, uh, oh, here, sorry. So we can look at the spread between um, the, the bond returns and the repo interest rates and write the basis in terms of the difference between uh, the, debt, the, 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 the debt spread for the domestic bond and the same spread for the foreign bond. Okay. So this spread tends to measure exactly the, the, the funding friction in that, in that bond. Or we can also write the basis in terms of other spreads, which are the spread between uncollateralized uh, interest rate and the repo rate. Okay. And write the basis in terms of the difference for, you know, of the, those two spreads for the domestic bond and the foreign bond. Okay. Uh, and uh, as, I had se as I have segmented the credit markets, seg segmented the um, unsecured credit markets, I have to do this for, for uh, using, um, uh, using the um, uh, specific banks and specific uh, offer rates for those banks. But if, if, if the offer rates of those banks are close to the average, I can interpret this as spreads, as uh, LIBOR repo spreads. So if we, now in this graph I compare what was the, the actual, what was the actual basis, it's the one I have here in red, and what is the basis computed with using our formula. So using the formula that I just uh, described uh, here, it's formula 14, in terms of the spreads between, um, sorry, no, not this one, sorry. In terms of this one, so the spread between uh, uncollateralized and collateralized uh, interest rates. So I'm comparing the what was the observed cross-currency basis, and here in green I have the, uh, the cross-currency basis computed using our formula, and I use Deutsche Bank as the representative bank. Okay. So the, even though we have some, a, a little gap here, but the pattern is quite, uh, quite the same for the two. Let me observe that uh, if we had collateral centralized repo, the results would not change. So, so far I have assumed that repo is bilateral and that uh, haircuts are being collected by the, um, the, the, the repo long, so the, the creditor in repo. But if we had the centralized repo, so done through exchanges, the exchange would collect margins from both sides. And we have also computed the, what would be the results in that case, and the, it, the results would not change. So we'd still have the same formulas um, that I've presented here for the um, uh, comparing the, the for the basis in terms of the spreads between um, between um, treasury returns and repo, or the spreads between uh, un uh, uncollateralized and collateralized rates. These same formulas would hold in the case of exchanges. One minute, okay. <laughs> 
So one minute, uh, I will just mention that, um, coming back to your question, that uh, if we compare what, we've di what we did with what uh, Galliano and uh, Peterson had done for the general um, deviations from arbitrage, they had this um, margin constraints that I've talked about before. So what was driving the deviations from uh, arbitrage was the opportunity cost of paying margins. In our case, what drives the deviations from arbitrage is the funding friction itself. So it's the, 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 it's the, the, the shadow value of meeting the funding uh, constraints. So even in our case, even if, if there are no margins, so even if haircuts are zero, we still have the same, um, the same formulas hold. The same formulas that I just described will still hold. It's, so it's not the fact that margins are being paid, it's the fact that, that funding has to be done uh, according to those box constraints. Okay. So to, to finish, let me just say that then we did an analysis of the policies used by the European Central Bank um, in, con in conjunction with the Fed. So uh, by uh, doing a swap with the Fed and then uh, giving uh, credit to the European banks where the European banks would, would um, uh, uh, use euro-denominated assets as collateral or even dollar-denominated assets as collateral. And we show what the, the cross-currency basis would be in terms of the, of the difference between the policy rate, the policy repo rate, and the market uh, repo rate. So we do that for the case of uh, uh, euro collateral or for the case of dollar collateral and, uh, and see that th these policies manage to, to reduce the, the cross-currency basis. So I'll stop now. <laughs>